Welcome back to Trump Deck Teachings. It's been a while, but there's a new format called Standard New, and with it comes its own decks. I want to keep the deck teachings new, recent, and relevant. So let's start off with one of the biggest hits of the Whispers of the Old Gods set release. And it's called Cthulhu Druid Solid Storm hit number one legend with this exact deck list. So it's pretty good. You have Cthulhu at the end, the big old god, which gets buffed for each Cthulhu minion you play. And those Cthulhu minions are Dark Arakoa, the big druid only card, 6 mana 5, 7. The Cthulhu's Chosen, 4 mana 4, 2 divine shield. Twilight Elder a little bit, 3 mana 3, 4, which will buff over time. Disciple of Cthulhu, 3 mana 2, 1, very efficient, deals 2 damage, so it's a fast card. And also Brand Bronzebeard is here to activate Battle Cries twice. So you can play this and then play any Cthulhu card, and that would be enough. Just Brand Bronzebeard plus any plus 2 Cthulhu card is enough to activate Claxi Amberweaver. A massive 410 if you have a 10 attack Cthulhu, and probably most importantly, Twin Emperor Vecklor, which on 7 mana you're getting two four sixes with Taunt, which is incredible value, and has earned the title, as I dub it, Emperor 7. Uh, the basic game plan of Cthulhu Druid is pretty simple. You're, it's very similar to Ramp Druid, where you're ramping with cards such as Wild Growth and Innervate. You can look at the Trump Basic Teachings Mana Efficiency video. Hey. That video has some excellent guidelines on how to play this deck in particular. Uh, I also recorded it under a druid. You're basically trying to play your minions on curve every turn and try to abuse the fact that Cthulhu druids, or druids in general, get to start off a little bit faster with their wild growths and innervates and they smooth out their turns with those mana acceleration cards. Yes, the Cthulhu cards are a little bit worse than typical cards. It's only a 3 mana 3 4, it's only a 4 mana 4 2 divine shield, it's only a 6 mana 5 7 taunt, but the thing is those cards are good enough by themselves. Uh, they may be a little bit worse, that's the trade back for buffing Cthulhu, but at the end the payoff is huge when you can play a 7 mana 2 4 6 taunts or a huge game finisher Cthulhu. Now if you're looking for the budget version of the deck, or perhaps even alternatives, uh, one notable card that hasn't been included in this deck, which was in here previously, in previous versions, is Beckoner of Evil. Uh, I can only hypothesize that Beckoner of Evil was removed in order to help against the specific meta that was faced. You'll notice that there's a meta choice of Harrison Jones in this deck, a lot of shamans and a lot of warriors were around during the play of this particular version of this deck, but in order to both cut costs or perhaps remain more relevant, you could put in Backer of Evil if the format becomes very fast and you need something to stop the early game. Uh, in order to remove some legendaries, you could remove Harrison. You could remove Bran. That's a tough one. Bran's really good. Put in Backer of Evils. Uh, Fandral Staghelm is a very powerful legendary which synergizes very well with Raven Idol and Living Roots and Wrath, but it is optional in the deck and with it you would perhaps remove a Raven Idol which is significantly less powerful with Fandral gone. Uh, you could add in another Living Roots, the other Klaxi Amberweaver, a really good card. It just happens that with Fandral Staghelm, Fandral is such a big threat and it also comes out on turn 4. Uh, fits a similar role to Klexi Amberweaver. And finally, instead of a Sylvanas, we could take something like a Twilight Elder. This version of the deck ends up being much cheaper, I would argue significantly less effective, but, you know, if you're on a budget, I think this deck will also get you to Legend. Uh, note that I have still included Twin Emperor of Eklor. this is a very important card in pretty much any Cthune deck. The value is off the charts. Listen! Well, let's uh, play the version that hit rank 1 legend. Part of what makes this deck so inexpensive is that when Whispers of the Old Gods first came out, everyone got 13 free packs through playing just a few matches, 
and everyone gets C'Thun, free of charge. So when you're playing the version without these other legendaries in them, all you have to get is Twin Emperor Vecklor, there's not even any epics in it. Uh, in fact, if anyone wanted to make a free-to-play run, I would say a C'Thun Druid deck, especially given the 13 free Whispers of the Old Gods packs that one gets, uh, will set this on a really good course. To the games! The cards you're generally looking for in the opening mulligan are going to be those early game cards, uh, Innervate, Wild Growth, which ramp you up against aggressive decks. Living Roots, Wrath, and Disciple of Cthulhu are good keeps. Oh, and also if you're going second, you can keep the reactive cards such as Wrath a bit more often. Given that it's a hunter, I'm going to mulligan away the Wrath. And nice, that's a beautiful curve. A happy little curve. Like I had alluded to on the deck building section, a lot of the lessons from mana efficiency can apply to this deck. It may seem a little bit strange that I called that I'm all getting away the wrath against the hunter and said something along the lines of keep wrath against aggressive decks. What's more aggressive than a hunter with that hero power, one may ask? Well, it turns out that hunters, at the current time of this game, uh, mostly were mid range with slower cards like Call of the Wild. Mm, there's the goodness of Disciple of Cthulhu. Uh, yet at the same time though, here's a example of a fast play versus a slow play. Uh, often there's going to be the decision to make between using a spell or playing a minion which is slow. For example, here it's very clear. Twilight Elder versus Disciple of Cthulhu. In Disciple of Cthulhu, you instantly remove that card, Flame Juggler. However, Twilight Elder will also kill that Flame Juggler, and I'm going to play it here. Because the Disciple of Cthulhu can be used a bit more flexibly. Uh, this is going to often be a case between, like, perhaps you have Wrath in your hand here, and that's an even more clear cut case of playing the Twilight Elder. Uh, you might look at the Disciple of Cthulhu and say, it does deal two damage, so why aren't you playing it? And you might also think, why are you calling Disciple of Cthulhu a spell? Well, it turns out that the battle cry of Disciple of Cthulhu is very similar to a spell. It's more used for the... it's kind of used for both. When you play a slow card, you exert more influence over the board the following turn. You always have the choice to get back to it later. You take an extra two damage, but... This thing had the benefit of buffing Cthulhu by one already, uh, as well as this one again, and if the opponent had played something such as... a Huffer, or a Leoc, or a Misha, uh, basically, this card can help deal 3 damage to it. With the help of the Wild Growth, the curve here is very good. Uh, with Dark Arakoa coming down next turn, almost certainly, it's going to be pretty tough for the Hunter to get past, as well as uh, having a board presence here early already. And it's pretty uncertain what that trap is, but I will check with Sap of Cthulhu in case it's Freezing Trap, and I will attack into it. An explosive trap was also uh, pretty likely. Nice to get another Dark Arakoa as well. A uh, nice strong card. So the game plan here is pretty straightforward. Uh, continue to play cards somewhat on curve while trying to stay alive, and Cthulhu is going to get pretty big. There is a dream situation where you can brand Bronzebeard, uh, your twin Emperor Vecklor, or your Cthulhu. That's really good when it happens. Never actually expected to happen, but it does happen every once in a while. Oh, how impressive. He removed one Dark Arakoa. Oh, I was going to play the other Dark Arakoa, but that's even better. Emperor 7 on 7. 
One of the big reasons to play a Cthune deck. The minions itself aren't bad, but with the Cthune synergies, you get some unfair things, such as on turn 7, you can play 8-12 worth of stats with Taunt, and on turn 10, you can deal 15 damage. Uh, in this case, it looks like it's going to be at least 18 damage. Generally a good idea to clear the Hunter's Beasts, because you play around Houndmaster and Kill Command. However, in this case, this is giving additional buffs to Cthune, and it's a better minion, and I have Taunt in the way, and it doesn't look like this beast synergy can be used in that way. Look at how excellent Twin Emperor Vecklor is. Uh, the opponent has had to use two cards and four mana to deal with half of Vecklor so far. Here, since, uh, eh, he's very low. At one point or another, this deck does also transform from a defensive deck to an aggressive deck. Uh, if your opponent is low, your Cthulhu can threaten lethal, and though that is a beast and it might be useful to you clear it, get those bits of damage on. Um, often, this deck doesn't even play Cthulhu because its minions are powerful enough and its curve can be strong enough with a early ramp that they can just beat up the opponent without having played Cthulhu. In this case, I happened to draw the fairly big minions later and have a early ramp, which is pretty much as good as this deck gets. Shamans can be very aggressive, so in this matchup, Living Roots and Wrath and Disciple of Cthulhu are great cards to keep. But as usual, Wild Growth and Innervate are the go-to cards. Harrison Jones was actually put in this deck as a metagame called because there were so many shamans around at the recording of this video. Sometimes you'll have the decision to Wild Growth or perhaps Wrath uh, something, and often the correct play is going to be to take the slow play yet again uh, to do the Wrath or to do the Wild Growth to get benefits in the future. Uh, for example, here I could play either of these minions, but I'm going to once again play Wild Growth for. When you ramp to the bigger mana cards. Yes, you'll play a few more slow cards, but they'll be very good slow cards. In this case, the Druid of the Claw looks like it'll be pretty good against that 3-4. I'll probably put it in taunt form. That's unfortunate. But this, uh... Bear just might hold off... long enough, and... With the extra mana to play around with early on, and it's possible that we can deal with even this extra totem golem. One very scary outcome that could happen is that new card that shamans have gotten, uh, 4 mana 7-7, seven, seven. with this hand there would be no answer to it. Usual answers to it though are having a combination of a little bit of board presence as well as a fast card uh, along with it, such as Wrath or Swipe. Fortunately, no, uh, 4 mana 7-7 seven, seven here. And also, fortunately, that Flame Juggler did not hit, causing him to have to use the Argent Square as well. Azure Drakes are pretty good in this deck. Uh, they affect the Wrath and the Swipe, and when they hit the Swipe, it's usually to very good effect. So, along with the concepts of mana efficiency, it seems like the play here is either going to be playing 2-3 drops, or playing a 3 drop of Wrath and a Hero Power, or playing the Azure Drake and a Wrath. Since against an aggressive deck like this, an aggressive opening, it's very important to spend all your mana. No In this case, I'm going to go for the extra card. I feel like uh, the extra option would be nice. And I'm going to remove this side of the fire, uh, Flame Tongue Toe. A little bit of a slower play, perhaps, than doing something such as Wrath the Flame Tongue Totem, Disciple of Cthulhu, this and then hero power this, uh, leaving a 
However, that also got rid of his board. Other than the Flame Tongue, which I believed I could still reach with Disciple of Cthulhu plus Hero Power. This is a tough call now. He's got a totem I have to get through, and two totems that are a big deal. I suppose, uh, this is actually not too bad. That Flame Tongue totem is not that bad when there are no minions on the board. The Feral Spirits are definitely a fear. Among other things. Uh, this hand is running out of steam. However, we were bound to get the good stuff eventually. It seems like this Dark Arakoa will trade into these two. It is also possible to use the Disciple of Cthulhu to trade into both. I mean, to eliminate one of them. I had stated that this deck top decks better than most decks, and it is true. Um, the main problem is that the opponent still has three cards in their hand, so not quite top decking yet. The Raven Idols are really nice and flexible as well. I think in this case we want a fast card, so a spell. That's often the choice of Raven Idol. A fast card versus a slow card, minion versus spell. And Starfire is an excellent pickup. A big spell which uh, furthers... Further is the digging in your deck, and we've gotten the big Cthune. It's quite certain to clear his board uh, with the help of this. One of the very rough ways of calculating how much uh, Cthune is likely to clear the board is to do a rough estimation. Divide Cthune by the number of things on the board. So there's five targets, so Cthulhu will on average deal three to each. So this only needs two, this only needs two, this only needs one. So these three are most likely to die. And then this would usually take three, but because these are kind of dying a bit early, maybe it can deal an extra two. So I would expect something like five, two, two, one, five, seven, eight, nine, and then uh, six on face. But in a very lucky world, Flame Reach Faceless is also removed. That's pretty lucky. Only three was dealt to the face. One of the cool things about Cthulhu is that Cthulhu continues to get buffed while he's on the board. That matters sometimes. Warrior is a bit of an interesting grab bag. Uh, there were some control variants and there were some... Uh, Tempo Warrior was very prevalent. Against Tempo Warrior in particular, and I had made the comments, it would almost always Living Roots on turn 1, but against Warrior perhaps not, because they have a lot of ways to clear off the 1-1s, one -ones, and the 1-1s one -ones aren't as relevant against, certainly not against Control Warrior, it almost certainly uh, it almost doesn't matter. And against uh, Tempo Warrior, doesn't seem to matter either. At the same time though, it's just a tempo card and you play Living Roots on turn 1 as 2 on ones and it's just good. So I'm gonna keep the Living Roots. It's... It's kind of a close call. Fandral Staghelm plus Raven Idol or plus Living Roots is very nice. I'll play the Living Roots on turn 1. If you have Fandral Staghelm ready to go in your hand, you generally do not want to play the Raven Idol because the extra card is so nice. 
At the same time, if you have no plays, though, you can still consider the Raven Elf, but I'm going to keep this around. I mean, that would be pretty awesome if the Living Roots managed to take out the coin and the Fiery War Axe. Here the Living Roots manages to take out a uh, Blood Cell Raider along with the help of the Sepple of Cthulhu. very nice. The alternative is to innervate out Harrison Jones, which is also a good play. But in this case, Pirate Warrior is quite an aggressive deck, and taking that out and preventing the 5 damage to face seems pretty important. As well, that weapon could stay around. Now one of the problems is, according to the theory of mana efficiency, on the next turn it seems like I want to play either a 5 drop or a 5 drop. Or a 5 drop. In this case, the innervate will make things not perfect, but still very important to play the Harrison. And given that this is such a tempo-oriented game, perhaps I play Raven Idol also anyways, even though Fandral Staghelm is in the hand. And I think the answer is yes. I'm going to discover a spell because spells are really good with Fandral Staghelm. Uh, it is more important, I think, to play with the mana efficiency here than play with the optimal Fandral Staghelm plus Raven Idol play. Not to mention, Fandral Staghelm doesn't even have to be the next play, I could play Azure Drake. Well, the next play is Azure Drake. I'm going to take Moonfire. Uh, obviously, this discoveries very greatly based off of what you expect to be playing. Uh, this looks like a very aggressive deck, so Azure Drake Moonfire seemed okay. In a game where you expect to be more controlish, you take the Wisps, especially since that deck probably doesn't run Ghoul. And there was that third choice, which also looked good, Mark of Yasharaj. You can hit that on your Druid of the Club. Brand Bronzebeard plus Disciple of Cthulhu is a common play that you'll be making in this deck. Uh, pretty powerful to have Disciple of Cthulhu deal 4 damage, like against this chick right here. 3 plus 3 the next turn. Uh, the opponent is making a mistake by trading. That is an aggressive deck. Oh, that's really good for him. But at least uh, this Captain Greenskin can be one shot with the help of Brand and Friend. The deck shouldn't have many more minions, uh, so I can go ahead and swipe that. Swipe helpful as a fast answer to deal for uh, in some matchups and sometimes useful to deal a lot of damage. For example, against Zoo, swipe is the best card. Oh, where's my swipe now, then? It's not very important. This is going there anyways, and the hero power takes that out. Ah! But Fandral Staghelm plus Wrath is so powerful. Deal 4 damage and draw a card on Tia Mana. And this can stay around and do even more things. That's an unusual card in this deck. And this explains why I don't see Validated Doomsayer in very many decks. Ho oh, ho, Raven Idol with Fandral Staghelm. One of the awesome things you can do with Raven Idol with Fandral Staghelm is, well, you always get a minion in a spell, but if you happen to get another Raven Idol, you can get a lot of value. I was going to click Gruel here, but Shield Bear is actually better. Alright, with no lethal options, looks like I'll just play this big guy and hang back. It was your fault. 
I've actually never seen the animation on Validea Doomsayer, so it's a shame that I killed that off. It would uh, be bad form to lose, I suppose. Oh yeah, we have a Cthune. It's pretty big. It's kind of cool. Poor Moonfire and Shield there. Never used. So those are the basics of Cthulhu Druid. Play on curve, know when to play the fast cards over the slow cards, and profit. A really good deck for learning the basics, as well as a top tier competitive deck. Uh, weaknesses to Zoo, Strengths against, uh, just generally good against most decks.